So of course, every journey begins with being a baby. Right? I was born and raised in the state of Ohio. I grew up in a very small town called Warren, Ohio. And after my dad retired, he was a pastor full time. We moved after he retired to Columbus, Ohio, and I was in high school at the time. In some ways, I kind of had a small town experience growing up, and then I moved to a larger city in my high school years. So again, my family is a really big part of my upbringing. It's really how I came to be who I am today. I have a very large extended family. I have brothers and sisters. I have half siblings. On my both of my parents' side, they each have a number of siblings. And everyone in my family was an important part of my journey. I've got two older brothers. They're on the far right. Philip, who is, the, is my oldest brother. And Walter is my next oldest brother. And then there's me in the family. And then my youngest sister, Bria. I think it's really important to recognize that I really owe a debt of gratitude and honor to my dad because he was a wonderful provider for our family. He was a very hard worker. He gave us everything we needed as children. And he was really an important um, foundational for my faith and spiritual upbringing. My mom, on the other hand, I don't have enough words to thank my mom and explain to you her impact on my life. She was a role model for me throughout my journey from childhood. She was a role model as a successful adult woman, and she just made it through everything that she faced, every adversarial situation she faced, she persevered and she was successful. And I'll always look up to her. I still do today. My older brothers really, they normalized my childhood. They never made me seem or feel different. They were just like, yeah, come play with us. You're just our sister. It doesn't matter that you're hard of hearing. And it was a normal childhood, thanks to my brothers. My sister, on the other hand, who I adore, I adore her because she's my younger sister, but because she was my younger sister, she made me very aware of my behaviors and my choices. She looked up to me, she copied everything I did, and I think that was an important early instructional experience for me because moving forward throughout my life, I always was more cognizant of the choices I was making. I was very motivated. I never sat back, I wasn't a wallflower. I stepped forward, I went after the things I wanted to pursue. And those were all important personality characteristics that I believe have, have propelled me to where I am today throughout my journey. So people always ask me, right, did you go to a mainstream school or did you go to a residential school for deaf students? I was mainstreamed. It was a program that was fairly new at the time. I was really the, kind of the first person to go through that experience. And you have to remember that many years ago, from going through a mainstream experience as a child to now, I experienced many firsts in my life throughout all of those settings. The center picture of my mom walking me to the bus is significant to me for two reasons. You see my mom holding my hand. I'm three years old at the time. And I have a daughter who's three right now, and I can't imagine doing what my mother did. I can't imagine sending my child to a program where she's going to be experiencing access and educational situations outside of the home. And my mother was fearless. I can't imagine having that same type of fearless ability to, to walk my daughter off to go to school. But that bus experience, when I got on the bus, it was the first time I realized that I was different, right? You know, the short bus jokes, right? Because it's a smaller bus. I experienced being the brunt of all of those short bus jokes. And I was with students who had intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, a number of varying disabilities. And I was there with those students all riding together on a very long bus drive to get to our school district. The school district was predominantly white predominantly hearing, and it was the first time in my 
three years of life that I recognized how different I was. So that's a significant time for me. Very briefly, my mainstream experience was similar to what many mainstream students feel. I signed more than I spoke, if you can believe that. Signing exact English was what I first learned. I remember that yellow book, I'd bring it to and from school with me, and we learned the prefixes and suffixes and the signs for all the articles in the English language. We signed every word, but I was motivated to learn sign. And my mother had a special education degree, so she always had already had basic survival signs, which is a blessing in a way because she had some basic signs to communicate with me. But again, the whole being on the short bus and being looked at as different and having people think that maybe I wasn't as capable really motivated me. And then the feather, you may recognize speech therapy for those of you who had speech therapy as a child. You'd have to blow on the feather and make all the right phonological sounds. But those were really keys early on for me to be able to speak with not only my non-signing family members, but with my extended family and my neighboring communities. So my mom wanted to sign more with me, but I was more motivated to practice speech. And I think that those are just very common experiences. I remember one thing in particular, there was a black book that I had, that composition book that you see a little picture of. And when school was over, like every other child, I'd be excited for summer vacation. I'd wanna ride my bike and have fun and play outside. But my mother hired a tutor and every day, all summer long, I had to write in my composition book. I was always thrilled when I got a chance to take a break from that and play. But I'll always be grateful to her because that continued learning, those experiences really motivated me. They helped me be a good student. <laughs> I have a mini flashback, although really I'm grateful. My mainstream experiences, again, were experiences that were common to many other mainstream students. I was more active than most students. I was very involved. I did track and field. I did all of the sports that students would do. I did discus, track and field. I did the shot put. I did all of those. I played softball. I was very active in clubs. And really, one thing that you may not realize, but I played the alto sax. I come from a very musically inclined family. And I always wanted to emulate that and play, a, play an instrument as well. So my mom said, sure. She bought the alto sax for me. I joined the band in fifth grade. I played the alto sixth all through high school. I was asked to do a solo performance for the jazz band. It was well received. I impressed myself. It was difficult for me to follow along and hear how I was playing, but I did so well, they asked me to be in the high school marching band. And so it's one of my accomplishments that I'm very proud of that's kind of unique to me. I struggled with my identity. Was I culturally deaf? Was I hard of hearing? Was I someone who was functionally hearing but thought more like a hearing person? Or was I more functionally deaf? I really struggled throughout my middle and high school years. Upon completing high school, well, one thing I want to mention before I move forward, the very end of my high school years, my uncle did my hair. I did my hair in a particular style. And I remember him saying to me one time, he's like, you know, one of these days, I know that you're gonna be standing in front of a big crowd, audience of people watching you, and you're gonna be a big star. And my uncle said to me at the time as he's doing my hair, he's like, you know, I think you should go to RIT because I saw some students there who were signing with their hands like you do. He was pursuing a hospitality degree and he would travel from Ohio to RIT while working full time to get his degree. And he said, I see deaf students there just like you. I think you should go. I think you should check it out, Alicia. And I always said no. 
right? I was a through and through Ohioan. I wanted to go to OSU, Ohio State University, or Kent State. And I had made my mind up. I wasn't gonna go to a school with deaf students. I wasn't gonna go to Gallaudet University. I didn't even know what RIT and TID was. I was ready to go to OSU football. And my mother went to Kent State University, so that was the reason that was my second choice. But I listened to him with an open mind. I listened to the stories that he told me about RIT. And then the Explore Your Future summer program came along and my mom really wanted me to go. I didn't want to, but she insisted that I go. Well, I can't tell you how EYF opened my eyes. I was in culture shock. Here I am a mainstream student, unfamiliar with other students like myself, but the greatest impact that EYF had on me was that I saw other deaf, black, hard of hearing students. I wasn't alone. I was the only one in my school. My school was predominantly white. Joe Hill, who's a good friend of mine, Dr. Joseph Hill. I remember him going to my high school a while back to present with me and he was shocked at what he saw. But when I came to EYF, I thought, wow, thank you, mom, because this was such an eye-opening experience. RIT is an amazing place. I'm not the only student like myself there. And then I had a cousin who wanted to go to RIT as well. So we both applied, we both got accepted, and it was such an exciting time for us to both begin these journeys. So EYF was really a significant factor and experience in me making my decision to attend. A number of great things happened in coming to RIT. I met my wonderful mentor and friend, Peter Hauser. At the time, typically, if you got a degree from RIT in some of the social work programs, you'd become a VR counselor. And that's the kind of the job that I envisioned that people would have. But then I learned that there were many other things I could do. While I was at RIT, I became very involved in a number of the clubs. One of them was important to me, Ebony Club. There were hard of hearing students, deaf students, mainstream students, sign students, oral students, students who simcom. It, everyone was welcome. No matter how you communicated or what your background was, everyone was welcome. If you were black, and you were an NTID student, you were welcome to join Ebony Club. And we were a family. The other important experience I had was getting involved in a play called Emperor Jones. It was a wonderful experience, not only for the play itself, but we went to New York City. We were able to perform off-Broadway. And another funny story, I think I was in my second year of RIT. And someone said to me, you can go to the National Deaf Black Advocates Conference. And I thought, sure, why not? summertime. I'm happy to go to a conference, see what I learned. I was dumbfounded. I was amazed at what I saw at the National Deaf Black Advocate Conference. Because I saw people who were much older than myself, who were black and deaf or black and hard of hearing, and they were signing and they had professional lives and experiences. And I never thought of myself beyond the age that I was but I was able to see role models who had progressed much farther through their life experiences than I had in my mind, an integral experience, very important to me that, I, that I'll always keep with me. A lot of things happened at Gallaudet University when I was there as a student. It's difficult to squeeze it all into a few points. I, I realized there's when I had so much potential it introduced me to cultural competency fields. It introduced me to multicultural experiences. I had a mentor with me the entire way. And when I got into the program, to this day, I wonder, wow, but I, made it. Program, but I made it. I got in and it was a place where I developed professionally. 
I had a number of professional experiences with regard to diversity issues, multicultural initiative issues, inclusivity issues, things that are important to what I'm doing today. I was involved in the second protest at Gallaudet University 2006 called Unity for Gallaudet. Again, we had, we had protests in the spring and the fall that year at Gallaudet. And it was a wonderful experience because it helped me look more closely at diversity issues. I was involved in multicultural research projects. I was providing therapy and counseling while I was on a student there to marginalized groups of students and seeing what impact therapy had on their lives. And so really the entirety of my experiences at Gallaudet University were eye-opening and enriching to me. I learned so much in so many different disciplines and arenas and had so many life experiences. There are probably two things that stand out to me to this day. I was a GSA, I was the Graduate Student Association president. Oh, and I was the president of Ebony Club too, but I was the president of GSA at Gallaudet. And that was probably the first group, in my experience anyway, that had a diverse e-board. There was James, he was black. The secretary was Michelle, she was Latino. I was the treasurer, or the treasurer was Latina as well, and then I was the president. I was a black, hard of hearing woman. And so here we are, this executive board of the GSA group. And we were diverse and we all got along and we ran an amazing club. And at Gallaudet, I was there when Obama became president in 08. So that was the second really impactful experience. To be able to be there at President Obama's inauguration, to be there present for the inauguration of the very first black president of the United States with the huge crowds that they had, it was our congressman from Ohio was there, and he was able to give some tickets out. And so I was able to get a ticket to attend. Congressperson's name, I apologize to him if he ever sees this, but I've got a picture there in my slide standing next to the congressman who gave me the ticket. And at that time, Earl and I were dating and he was in Philadelphia, so he couldn't go. So I took my best friend with me, which is that other picture you see on the bottom right. And it was just the most amazing experience. I got my degree from Gallaudet University in 2010 and it was signed by Obama. This one's tough, 2010 to 2015. Again, hard to put this into words, but I call them in summary, my I quit years. It was during that period when I wrote a really long letter. I would say maybe it's 20, uh, maybe 2011, maybe, I think it was 20, hmm, I think it was closer to 2013. The year is irrelevant. I wrote a long letter to my department at Gallaudet University, basically saying, you're all wonderful. It's not you, it's me. I'm done. This isn't for me. Right, 2010, those next few years that ensued, so much was going on. I couldn't keep up with my studies. I was working full time. I had several different jobs throughout those years that I did. I didn't feel focused. And I just felt like I wasn't able to continue my, my degree studies. And so I quit. I thought, great, peace out, I'm done. And then when they received the letter, the department chair came up to me and said, you know what? I think it's probably better if you take a leave of absence. So I took an LOA. During that LOA, I got married. February 2010 was when there was a huge snowstorm in Washington, D.C. My husband now, but he wasn't at the time, drove from Philadelphia to help me get out. And we moved to Philadelphia. My first job at Philadelphia was with uh, partners and deaf partners in service. And it was an agency that provided mental health services to the community. They had residential services, case management, counseling services. And I performed all of those various roles within the agency. So I was one year at partners and then I 
I was invited to NTID and I heard that they were hiring for a career in academic counselor. So I applied and I didn't get it. But then just before the semester began, one person left the department and I was able to come in for one year and have that career, have that experience as a career in academic counselor at NTID. So I was there for one year. And not surprisingly at all, Peter Hauser found me. He's my guy. He says, Alicia, what are you doing? And I was like, you know, I quit. I'm really not into the whole degree thing. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're going to be fine. And he just wrapped his arms around me and propelled me to continue going. And when I got back to Philadelphia a year later and passed my pre-dissertation defense is that picture of me in the peach shirt. Then I worked at the Marie Katzenbach School for the Deaf, and I worked with uh, providing services to emotionally disturbed children, children who had be, uh, behavioral uh, issues and challenges. It was more clinical work. I also worked to establish a pro pro program to uh, support teenagers who were in challenging situations. I moved three or four times in those five years. Again, I had a number of jobs. It was really a tumultuous crazy time. And so I simply call them the I quit years, even though during those years, many wonderful things happened, like my pre-dissertation defense and like getting married to Earl. When I look back upon them, I'm grateful. Another very difficult and impactful life-changing experience happened when <sighs> my grandfather passed away. A huge loss in my life, but all in all, I'm grateful for all of those experiences because they've helped shape who I am today. So I thought that I was giving up, but then someone said, hey, hey, come on now, we need you. And that was Jennifer Gravitz. At that time at RIT, I had met her when I was an academic advisor briefly. And she called me, now I was in Philadelphia at the time, she called me and said, you need to apply for this psych degree. And I said, well, I don't have a PhD, so I don't want to waste your time. And I specifically said that, I don't want to waste your time. You know, I am working full time, I have bills to pay, I don't want to waste your time, I can't do it. But she begged me and she convinced me and she said, I will support you through this. She said that she would be with me every step of the way, that she would mentor me through this. She invested so much time in me, in mentoring me through this whole process of the application. She also provided, Joseph Hill, my good friend, applied at the same time that I did, and so we were a good cohort supporting each other through that process. And then we got in, the application made it, I got the interview, and then I was rejected after the interview. And so I said, I knew it, I knew it. See, this is what I thought it would happen. But Jennifer said, no, 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 no. She said, you are an important part of this. I want you to teach this class. And she fought behind the scenes and somehow magically she made it happen. She told me I have some kind of magic. I don't know what it was exactly, but she did her magic and she got me back just barely before fall of 2015 semester started. My grandfather had just passed, I had gone through all of these different things, and she got this for me. So I went back to RIT, and if you can imagine, I was long distance from my husband Earl again, but I thought it would be all right, I was excited to start teaching, I really love teaching, I enjoy teaching, working with people in the department, seeing some old friends that I had met before, so that was really wonderful to get back to RIT. And just as I got started with this, just as I had reconnected with Peter to restart my research, as soon as that got going, I realized that I was pregnant. So at that time, Earl and I were long distance. So I joke that it was sometime during one of our conjugal visits <laughs> that I got pregnant. But anyway, not in prison. No one was in prison. But I got pregnant and I did not know what to do. I had just done all this, I had just made these connections and gotten in and now I was pregnant, so what do I do? I'm long distance from Earl, should I move back to Philadelphia? Should he move to Rochester? Should I just give this whole thing up? 
But Earl supported me. He said, you stay, you finish your degree. And he supported me 100% throughout the process. So I was pregnant for four or five months alone. I was pregnant by myself in Rochester. And Jennifer, by the way, Jennifer passed away recently and um, it's such a huge loss, but she wanted to get Earl here. So she sat down with us, she reviewed our budget, she reviewed uh, what we could do. She's a lawyer as well, she was a lawyer. So she looked over everything, all of the different details of our lives. And she was able to get Earl to Rochester. And some people look at that, this is a welcome pause. Some people looked at it as unnecessary, but I think that it was a blessing. My daughter Phoebe was born and that's helped me reflect on my life and reprioritize some things. Before then I was sort of directionless. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but that helped me get a handle on things and helped me narrow my focus and decide what I wanted to do. So my baby is now three. In the middle picture is the most recent picture of her. She is my pride and joy and I'm so grateful for her. So now I was back to work. I had had Phoebe and I was finally able to collect my data. And that was a very cool experience for me because somehow, don't ask me how, but somehow I begged. I went to all of these different organizations to beg, but I got, I needed at least a hundred subjects for my dissertation. And I remember Jennifer supporting me, giving me some money and resources to be able to do that. I begged and begged. And another thing that I didn't mention is that I had emailed some friends in different departments, some other professors, mm -hmm. and they were happy to send my information out to their students to try and recruit students that way. And at the beginning mm -hmm. of my presentation, I talked about it takes a village. Mm -hmm. And this is where my village really came up. The NTID village is incredible. Mm -hmm. They supported me in such a big way. If you can see at the top left here, that's the line snaking outside of the SDC. That's a line of people interested in being involved in my research. Joseph Hill, Bakar, so many different people worked with me constantly in the evenings outside of work hours. And I expected Jennifer to be home with her family, but she often came and helped me. And just everyone really supported me through this and helped me collect my data. It was incredible, and it's such a fond memory. This happened at the end of the semester, that time when most people are studying for final exams, they're a little bit tired of school. But Jennifer, initially, I wasn't sure that this was a good idea to have it at the end of the semester, but Jennifer encouraged me to do it, get it done, and it's amazing how the NTID Village supported me through this. So I'll jump a little bit quickly here. I had a number of different experiences, but in the end I got to my dissertation defense. This isn't the best picture, but I wanted to capture the size of the room and the number of people who showed up. I thought there would be a handful of people, maybe 10 or 15 people, but in fact the room was packed. I was overwhelmed with the amount of support I got. It was really amazing for my dissertation, def for my dissertation defense. That happened just last year, just about a year ago. And I still sometimes am in disbelief that I made it, I got it through that, and I had so much support from everyone. So I'll share a bit about my research here briefly. Uh, if people sometimes wonder about my research journey and what I researched, so this is what I did. I was interested in the black experiences and something with self-esteem, something with the black experience that I couldn't quite nail down. And then I realized I wanted to look into hard of hearing people's experiences. For me, as a hard of hearing person struggling to develop my identity, I wanted to look at a population similar to me. And there are many different parts of my research, so I'll try to keep it brief here. I wanted to look into the different factors that could impact the psychological well-being of hard of hearing people. So psychological well-being is defined by having self-esteem and satisfaction with life. Those are the two key elements. And I was curious, how does identity, my measurement to be close enough to identity,
was the acculturation scale. So I was looking at self-esteem comparing to the um, deaf acculturation scale. And the deaf acculturation scale has several different values, several different rate variables. So whether or not a person uses spoken English or ASL, uh, whether they went to a deaf residential school or were mainstreamed, whether their parents were involved in their education and upbringing, so a number of different variables. And I was curious which of those variables may contribute to psychological well-being, if any of them. Some of the variables weren't important, many of them weren't important, but a few of them were. I also looked at relationships between identity, so for a person who identifies as deaf, capital D, deaf, and is very proud of their deaf identity, do they have higher self-esteem? What is their self-esteem like? versus people who um, feel unsure of their identity and do not have a strong identity. So I wanted to look at that correlation between a person's identity and their psychological well-being. So there were many, many different parts of this research, but the thing that seemed consistent throughout is that results show that the most important thing is having a strong connection. If someone has a strong connection to deaf family, hearing family, school, family, education, whatever it may be, that sense of belonging and connection is important and has a huge impact on a person's overall psychological well-being, in addition to a few other variables, but that was the most consistent. So that was my dissertation. And then this is more Peter's fault, this part. I'm kidding about that. But I needed to do some more research and I needed to continue this type of research. So what came to mind was to look at not only the psychological well-being, but a person's satisfaction with life. So what type of things make hard of hearing people satisfied with their lives? So I took some information from my dissertation and I collected some new data. And I looked at satisfaction with life and then what variables contribute to a person being satisfied with their life. So a sense of belonging. So I mentioned that a strong connection is important. That was a finding from my dissertation. So we have conne connection and then self-esteem. And I was curious if those contribute to satisfaction with life. And of course, for psychological metrics, you have to have validity and reliability checks. So this is my reliability check. This is where I wanted to make sure that the test I gave that if I'm asking the same questions, that the results will be consistent, that the test is measuring what I'm expecting it to be testing. So I collected data about whether people were satisfied with life and their self-esteem and their sense of belonging. And I used Chromebacks Alpha to compare those. And I found that there was about 0.7 or above is important for that number. 0.7 is good, 0.8 is better, and then 0.9 is the best. So of all of these metrics, I have at least 0.7 or 0.8. Some of them are a little bit below 0.8, but I analyze the results with caution. So there's my word of warning there, but they are reliable. So from there, I did a hierarchical linear regression. Now, satisfaction with life is what I was studying primarily, and I was curious what contributes to that and whether or not self-esteem contributes to that. And I found out that, in fact, both self-esteem and sense of belonging both do significantly contribute to satisfaction with life. So then I was curious how much they contribute, and I found roughly 30% so self-esteem explains about 30% of satisfaction with life, where sense of belonging explains about 80% of it. So remember that the reliability scale could impact those results somewhat, and I also haven't completely finished with this paper. That is something that is on my to-do list that Peter's waiting for me to finish this paper. It is a work in process for me. This research is still ongoing, but I will finish it by the end of next month. I will do it. So, and again, I haven't finished writing all of the results, but based on my literature review, based on previous research, it seems that my findings here of who is satisfied with their lives 
really depends on their resources and their ability to navigate. That applies to both hearing and deaf people. And that had a huge impact on me because I look back at my success, I really oscillated between the deaf and hearing worlds. So I can see that this was certainly significant for me. Another thing that is critical, that is so important no matter what, is having a sense of belonging. It doesn't matter if a person is deaf or hearing or somewhere in between, that sense of belonging is critical. People who are hard of hearing often feel that they don't fully fit in either world, that they're somewhere in between the deaf world and the hearing world. And they often feel that. And as a hard of hearing person myself, especially for hard of hearing people who lose their hearing later, whose hearing gets worse later, it can be very difficult to fully identify with one community or the other. But the point is that it's critical to have a sense of belonging somewhere. This is an important question, right? When you ask yourself, what do you need to be successful? What was the most helpful thing to me to get me to where I am today? For a dissertation, it's a research community. That is critical. My research community is like gold to me. I hold them so near and dear to my heart. I cried thinking about leaving the lab. I absolutely panicked thinking that I would not have these folks to go back to. That place, the NCCL, oh my goodness. Not only was it a place for me to do my research, but it was a place for me to discover who I was. I was welcome, I had an opportunity to be myself, to vent, to communicate and interact with a number of different people, get a number of different perspectives, see their strategies, see what other research was going on, Susan sat across from me, other close friends and researchers sat across from me. Everyone gave me support, life support, research support. Joseph Hill was there. Many of you who know me know that Joseph Hill and I are very good friends. Dr. Jess is there. And many of you might feel like you're an introverted researcher. But when you meet Dr. Jess, you recognize she's an extroverted researcher. She's such a gregarious, warm person. And all of those personalities make up the NCCL. Along with Peter, who's a research expert, the entirety of the lab has access, it's energetic, and the synergy is incredible. There's one final picture in there where they hosted a birthday party for me. And it was the best party. It was like cotton candy and cake and this huge party atmosphere. NCCL is famous for hosting birthday parties. They want to recognize everyone's special day. And so when you walk in, it's an hour of frantic celebration. And then everybody goes right back to work as if nothing ever happened. It's just fascinating. It's the most amazing amazing place and near and dear to my heart. And now with the coronavirus and communicating through Zoom, we've managed to keep that whole family connection feel, which is important to me. And again, a research community is critical. Mentors are critical in your journey. I had the best mentors. I had several mentors. Some of them aren't pictured here. But I'd like to highlight those who have been with me through my journey for my doctoral program. Right in the middle, middle picture, you see those individuals. I wouldn't have gotten through my dissertation events without Peter Hauser and Jennifer Gravitz and Dr. Jess. I remember calling Peter one time, FaceTime in the morning, and I was ready to go in. Oh, I forget if it was. I had a conversation with Peter, and they were just like, okay, you got this. And I was ready to go in and defend my dissertation. And I went in and I defended my dissertation. And Peter's like, okay, that's it. You're done. You're coming to Rochester now. And here I am. And it's amazing. But Jennifer Gravitz was there. And she brought me back to Rochester. She was integral in bringing me back to Rochester. So again, these precious people were with me the whole way. Getting involved in NFPA and the position that I have now, Dr. Buckley's support, Jess's support. There were people who just wouldn't let me leave, right? I threatened to leave more than once. One time in particular, I remember, I said, I'm done, that's it. 
And she said, you're not done. I will drag you back myself, right? She was kind of like a black mom looking out for me, keeping me on in track. But it was great because it's what I needed. I needed that tough love. I needed that unconditional support. I did my externship at a multicultural community center. It's where I gained a number of competencies and multicultural diversity and inclusion experiences. And some of the mentors from that time, every one of these individuals was important to me. Finally, get yourself some friends and family who you absolutely adore and can't live without because they will keep you grounded. They will allow you to be who you are throughout all of your experiences. My girls have been with me from undergraduate time right up to today. We are still close today. We Zoomed a couple weeks ago. We had a meeting together. And again, we've all experienced the same journey, identity crises, difficulties with our educational experiences, but we're in it for each other and we're in it for life. Still to this day, we are as connected as we always were. It's peer support, it's unconditional love, it's friendship that lasts a lifetime. Again, I cherish these people, my friends and family. They make me who I am. They keep me going every day. The folks that you see here in all of these pictures, they will show up at graduations and birthday parties for the littlest of celebrations to the biggest of celebratory events. They're always there for me, no question, day in and day out. Whether it's my sister Bria being there for my graduation or when I get a new job or complete some other important task in my life, all of these people are there for me. And they don't have to be for big reasons. Your family and friends will be with you through all of it. With this whole coronavirus, we still get together via Zoom. We find ways to stay connected and support one another. And these people are everything to me. So where, does, where has my journey brought me to from then until today? And what's next for me? Well, I'm still overwhelmed. I was completely blown away. I wasn't ready for it to be announced to the community when it was. I'm still trying to keep up with thanking everyone and I'm so incredibly grateful and overwhelmed. But I am the new Director of Diversity and Inclusion, in case some of you don't know yet. I've been named the new Director of Diversity and Inclusion at NTIDRAT. So, from that first hand-holding walk to the short bus with my mother, to gaining empathy for the students who were with me on that bus, to feeling excluded and isolated and alone throughout the entirety of my journey and all of my personal experiences, I always had a deep desire and hunger to learn more about people. Through my experiences at Gallaudet University that gave me a sense of professionalism and professional experiences that I wouldn't have gained otherwise, to Jennifer Gravitz bringing me back to NTID to gain teaching experiences, none of them were for naught. None of them were a mistake. They were all a blessing along the bumpy road throughout my journey, but it's brought me to where I am today as the new DDI director so that I can give back to the community that's given me so much, so that I can utilize all the skills that I've gained to create the community that we all want to see. One thing, I, you know, I thought I'd show you this PowerPoint through pictures. But there was one event, it was an RIT alumni event that took place in Philadelphia that I didn't get in this PowerPoint, except for this one picture here with Jerry Buckley. And how ironic that he came to an NTID Alumni Association event in Philadelphia. I have this picture memorializing it. And now here I am, he's my boss. Just a few short years later, I could have never imagined in a few short years that I would be working for the president of NTID that I would be advising him, that I would be doing all of the amazing things that I'm going to be doing in this new role. It still blows my mind. <laughs> so. I still feel like it's a moment in time that I'll never forget. I really don't have words for this slide, to be honest with you. I feel myself welling up looking at this slide because my mom was the role model for navigating unchartered 
challenging times as a black woman trying to get an engineering degree but couldn't, faced, faced sexism, racism, oppression, went to the liberal arts field to get her degree. <laughs> and she's just, she perseveres through thick and thin. She encouraged me to try new things all the time. Tomorrow I was supposed to be in Washington, D.C. to get my degree and walk across the stage at Gallaudet University. And we were going to be walking it together. She was going to be with me on that stage in my heart and soul. She graduated from high school during the time of segregation in America. Imagine that. Imagine her pursuing a degree at a predominantly white university, Kent State University. She made it through thick and thin. She persevered. And I believe that she was there at Kent State University when they had the terrible massacre that happened. She was present for those things. And she's persevered and she's been successful. She's tenacious. She's strong. She's powerful. She got, she got her master's degree. I remember that. She used to take me to the library with her. I'd bring my little book bag. I'd be studying like my mom. She'd have stacks and stacks of books and I'd have my little library books. And I remember watching her study and I wanted to go with her to the library just to be with her, but she brought me along. And I realize now, looking back that early exposure at six, seven, eight years of age, going to the library with her, some of her classes I even attended with her and I would just be under the desk with my little books quietly keeping myself busy, that early exposure to her academic experiences were like a prophecy. She was planting seeds with every minute that she was around me, with everything that she exposed me to. She was planting the seed to lead me to where I am today. And I need to shut up because I'm going to start crying. But the only thing I can say is that I love her more than I can even express. And I'm done. I'm done, right? When I look at this picture, it was um, Tammy Wells. She did a project, it was a picture behind windows, she's a local photographer. And I was like, uh, do you mind taking my picture in my new cap and gown with my degree? Cause I'm supposed to be graduating, but it's not happening. And I'd really like a picture of this really special day to send to my mom and dad. You know, just, I'm gonna send it as a belated, Mother's Day gift, but it'll eventually get there. But I had her take this picture. And when I look at this, I'm just, I'm, I'm speechless. I did it. I did it. I'm done. Fini. I still can't believe it. Right? I had a little early graduation for myself taking this picture a couple weeks ago, and it was worth every second of it. And I'm still thrilled that I have a job, that I've got this new role at NTID, that I'm going to be here for a number of years to attend future graduations. So it'll be an honor to be for, there for every one of them. So that's my journey. It was difficult work. It's our success. My journey, my experience is our community success. All of the firsts that I experienced as a member of the Black Deaf community is a win and an experience for the entire community. All of the people that sat with me, held my hand side by side, supported me through my journey, were crucial to me getting here. The individuals that helped me through my dissertation, the folks that listened to me cry and whine day and night, I thank each and every one of them for their support. My NCCL family, it's a village. You're all my village. You're all the rock that my success is built. I couldn't do it without you.